Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 281 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about alien demons. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Whenever people consider what might be responsible for mysterious phenomena, there are two explanations they often leap to. First, that aliens are responsible, and second, that demons are responsible. And here on Mysterious World, that's led to two tongue-in-cheek sayings. It's always aliens, and it's always demons. But some people combine these hypotheses and hold that aliens are, in fact, demons, that UFOs and extraterrestrials are manifestations of demonic activity. So what's the truth? Is it always alien demons? And how could we figure this out? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. And Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin considering today's mystery? I want to be very clear about precisely what the mystery is. Uh, Nobody claims that all UFO sightings or alien reports are demonic. Many UFOs have purely natural explanations, like people misidentifying astronomical phenomena, like the planet Venus as a UFO, or seeing a classified aircraft and thinking it's a flying saucer, or things like that. Similarly, sometimes when people report contact with aliens, it also has a natural cause, such as hoaxes, um, mental illness, and imagination. The question is, how can we explain the remaining UFO and alien reports when you remove those that have purely natural causes or purely normal natural causes? And it's here that the alien demon hypothesis comes in. As you said, some people think that UFOs and aliens are simply demonic phenomena. You hear a lot of people in the Christian community say things like, aliens are just demons. That's especially common in the Protestant community, though you hear it among some Catholics as well. So that's the hypothesis that we'll be considering today. Do you think that any UFO alien reports are caused by demons? Well, I can't rule it out, and I don't rule it out. Uh, Demons certainly have the ability to pretend to be UFOs or aliens, and it may well be that some reports are caused by demons. You need evidence of demonic activity to show that a particular experience involved a demon, and that evidence may exist for some cases. I'm not challenging that idea. Instead, what I want to consider is whether all UFO alien reports that don't have normal causes are produced by demons. We're not considering whether demons are responsible for some cases. We're considering whether it's always demons, whether every single case that doesn't have a normal explanation is demonic in origin, allowing people to say things like aliens or demons without further qualifying that. All right, then how do you want to begin? By reminding the listeners of a few basic principles, we discussed these principles back in episode 188 on whether it's always demons, and we saw in that episode how just automatically leaping to the demon hypothesis can do tremendous damage. We began episode 188 with a whole bunch of stories in which people diagnosed their children as being possessed, they tried to exercise them at home, the exorcisms went wrong, and the children died. And all of those stories were recent and had occurred just in the prior two years. We also saw how attributing everything that we don't understand to demons would have stifled the development of medicine and science. And we saw how leaping to the demon hypothesis causes Christians to look foolish to outsiders and thus harms people's souls by encouraging them to scoff at the gospel if Christians are making it look ridiculous by attributing everything to demons. Uh, Christians give scandal to others in the proper sense of scandal, meaning leading people to commit sin, when they reflexively leap to the demon hypothesis. As St. Paul says in Romans 2.24, God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
So you can't and shouldn't and mustn't declare something to be a demon without evidence. You need to remember that not everything unknown is a demon, not everything that's scary or frightening is a demon, and not everything that's sinister or harmful is a demon. God has a big universe, and it includes many mysterious things, like historical and scientific mysteries. It includes some things that are scary or frightening, like axe murderers and grizzly bears, and it includes some things that are sinister or harmful, again, like axe murderers and grizzly bears. So if you want to say that a demon is involved, you need to show more than that it's unknown, scary, or sinister. Then how do you want to proceed in considering the issue? To really dig into the issue, I need to find a source I needed to find a source of arguments where people were doing more than just asserting that it's all that all aliens are demons. Anybody can assert anything they want, but that doesn't give us evidence that it's true. I needed to find someone who was actually making arguments for the alien demon hypothesis, and I found some. I discovered a book called Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men by three evangelical authors. One of the authors, Mark Clark, is a political scientist, and he contributed a couple of chapters about alleged government cover-ups and conspiracies involving UFOs. But the main two authors were Kenneth Samples and Hugh Ross. Ken Samples is an apologist with an evangelical ministry called Reasons to Believe, and Hugh Ross is an astronomer who founded Reasons to Believe. I've read works by both of them before, and they're both on the side of the angels. They're both striving to help spread the gospel and bring people to Jesus, which is awesome. Though I would say that I'm not impressed with all of their arguments. Can you give an example of arguments of theirs that you're not impressed with? Hugh Ross is known for trying to use design arguments to prove the existence of God, and that in itself is great. You can use arguments from design to argue that God exists. Lots of apologists do that. Ross seeks to show that the universe is specially designed for life by how precisely various cosmological constants are set. And I think that's a good strategy in principle, but I'm suspicious of the number of constants that Ross appeals to and the math he uses in his argument, which is to say, I think the main argument from cosmological constants is good in principle, but I'm dubious about the version of the argument that Ross proposes. He also tries to argue that it's not just the universe that's specially designed for life. He claims that our own solar system specifically is specially designed for intelligent life with the right-sized planets and our moon at just the right distances and in just the right orbits with the right kind of star. And here, I think he's on shaky ground. He's kind of off on his own with this argument. It's not one that other apologists really use, and I don't know how much evidential power it has. Ross also is known for trying to reconcile modern astronomy with a day-age theory of how Genesis 1 is meant to be interpreted. But I have to say that he completely misreads Genesis 1, and in the attempt to make his theory work, he has to force multiple highly implausible interpretations on the biblical text. So if I were grading him, I'd give Ross an A for effort and creative thinking, but I'd probably give him at best a C for many of his arguments. What about the book Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men? What do you think of it? I thought it had both strong and weak points. Uh, one of its strong points is that it's clear that Ken Samples is very knowledgeable about modern UFO history, and I was pleasantly surprised to see how familiar he was in his chapters with the UFO movement. It's quite clear that he's done a good bit of study of it. Another strong point was that these chapters did a good job summarizing UFO history in a factual and largely neutral way. Uh, samples didn't unduly beat up on people he disagreed with, though you could tell when he disapproved of something. How, how did he display his disapproval? Well, for example, both he and Ross used the word occult as a scare word, as if anything occult is automatically bad. However, as we discussed in episode 105 and again in episode 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult, the word occult from the Latin word occultus just means hidden. And Aquinas and other great medieval theologians acknowledge that there are lots of things in the world that were or are hidden from the knowledge of man. One of the examples that Aquinas cites is magnets. 
At the time, nobody had any idea how magnets worked, so magnetic fields were a hidden or occult operation of nature. We didn't figure out how magnets really worked until the development of quantum mechanics in the 20th century, but just because the knowledge was occult or hidden from man didn't make magnets sinister or satanic. It was just something that God hadn't let man learn yet. However, the way Samples and Ross use the term occult is basically a synonym for demonic or satanic. Anyone who is doing anything they consider occult is doing something demonic or satanic in their eyes. If Samples has studied the modern UFO movement, does he or Ross display comparable knowledge of parapsychology? No. From reading the book, I got the very clear impression that they know much less about parapsychology than they do UFOs, and they've given it much less thoughtful consideration. Because they just dismiss all of parapsychology and psychic functioning as occult and thus functionally demonic, which is very different than the Catholic attitude. As we mentioned in our episodes on St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult, great theologians and doctors of the church like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas believed in what we would now call psychic powers. They both believed in what's now called precognition, which St. Thomas Aquinas called natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. Aquinas also believed in a form of psychokinesis or mind over matter as a natural human ability. And as we saw in episodes 246 and again in episode 247, the church has basically no problem with the psychic ability known as dowsing. It even allows priests to serve as dowsers in scientific parapsychological experiments. But Samples and Ross would dismiss all of this as demonic and or as a cult and thus functionally demonic. Well, at least they had devoted significant study and thought to the question of UFOs and aliens, though. So let's talk about their arguments for why all non-natural UFOs should be regarded as demonic. What did they say? They actually say a whole bunch of different things. And nowhere in the book do they provide a comprehensive summary of their arguments. So I have to kind of stitch them together from a bunch of different places. They are kind of sort of organized, but I'm going to try to present them in, in an even more organized way. Sometimes they just briefly mention something in passing, and sometimes they have an in-depth discussion of the point. It's also not always clear what they intend as an argument. For example, they will note characteristics that UFOs have, and they will say, UFOs have this characteristic. But it's not always clear if they regard the characteristic they name as evidence for the demon hypothesis even though it's embedded in a list of characteristics that clearly includes things they think support the demon hypothesis. So in summarizing their case, I'm doing the best I can with a rather problematically presented set of arguments. Still, I appreciate the fact that they're actually trying to provide arguments. They're not just asserting that aliens must be demons. They're trying to give reasons for thinking that this is the case. So I want to give them credit for that. Also, because they wrote a whole book, and I try to keep our episodes under two hours, I won't be able to respond to everything they say in the book, but I will try to cover the main points. How is their basic case structured? Essentially, they focus on two rival interpretations of UFOs and aliens. The first is what's known as the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and this is by far the most common hypothesis, the one that most people are familiar with. Basically, it holds that UFOs are nuts and bolts craft that are built by extraterrestrials who come from a planet somewhere else in our physical universe, like, you know, in our galaxy or in another galaxy. The second interpretation is known as the interdimensional hypothesis, and this holds that UFOs and their occupants aren't actually of extraterrestrial origin. That is to say, they're not from somewhere else in our physical universe. Instead, on the interdimensional hypothesis, they're from another dimension. And Ross and Samples interpret that other dimension as being the one where angels and demons are from. Are those the only two options? No, in the first place, there are alternatives to both the extraterrestrial and the interdimensional hypothesis. One is the cryptoterrestrial hypothesis. This view holds that UFOs and their occupants are actually from here on Earth, but they come from a race that's hidden. 
In Greek, the word for hidden is kryptos, and in Latin, the word for earth is terra, so a race of hidden earthlings has been called crypto-terrestrials. We'll be discussing the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis more in a future episode, but we won't be focusing on it here. Another alternative view is that UFOs and their occupants actually come from a different time. Specifically, it's been proposed that they are beings from our future, and perhaps they're doing studies on us, their ancestors. This view is sometimes called the extratempestrial hypothesis. In Latin, the word extra means outside, and the word for time is tempus, so extratempestrials would be people from outside our own time. However, extratempestrial is a difficult and unfamiliar word, so we'll just be calling this the time travel hypothesis. We'll also be discussing the time travel hypothesis in a future episode. However, this is another alternative to the two hypotheses that Ross and Samples consider in their book. They never mention either the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis or the time travel hypothesis. Is their understanding of the interdimensional hypothesis with the interdimensional creatures being angels and demons, is that the only one? No, not at all. Uh, this is because we still have to ask what is the nature of the dimension that UFOs and aliens come from if they're coming from another dimension. We live in a physical dimension where we have physical matter and energy. And the same could be true of where aliens live. They also may come from a physical dimension. The laws of physics there might be exactly the same as the laws of physics here, or they might have somewhat different laws of physics, but either way, it may be a physical dimension like ours. However, angels and demons are not physical. They are spirits, created intellects that do not natively have anything physical about them, so they would come from a spiritual dimension. But Ross and Samples gl gloss over this issue. They do note that the other dimension might be physical, but then they just seem to assume it's spiritual without clearly arguing this point. Also, we're really looking. I guess I should say, so we're really looking at a situation where we have five major interpretations of UFOs and aliens. Ranked in order of weirdness, they would be, one, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, two, the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis, three, the time travel hypothesis, four, the physical interdimensional hypothesis, and finally, five, the spiritual interdimensional hypothesis, and it's the last one of these that you need if you really want to maintain the demon view. But they ignore several of these ideas. They focused only on the extraterrestrial and the spiritual interdimensional hypothesis, and they don't devote any significant attention to the others, including the physical interdimensional hypothesis. How do they argue with regard to the two possibilities that they do consider? Essentially, their case consists of two parts. First, they seek to offer arguments against the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and second, they seek to offer arguments in favor of their spiritual interpretation of the interdimensional hypothesis. All right, then let's talk about this issue from the reason perspective. How do Hugh Ross and Ken Samples argue against the extraterrestrial view? Their main argument consists of three prongs. The first prong of the argument is based on the fact that Hugh Ross is an extreme rare earther. The rare earth position holds that earth-like planets should be rare in the universe, and the same goes for any other habitable bodies. On this view, there would be almost no places for extraterrestrial life to exist, and Hugh Ross is on the extreme end of the rare earth spectrum. He believes that of naturally occurring planets, only one in 10 to the 174th power planets should be able to support life. That's one. That's a one in one followed by 174 zeros. However, this is a truly vast number that far exceeds the number of planets that should be in the visible universe. Therefore, Ross concludes that there should not even be one planet that is naturally capable of supporting life in the entire universe, not even Earth. The only reason that Earth supports life, in his view, is because it isn't a naturally occurring planet. Instead, God has specially made Earth 
to be able to support life. So he concludes that there shouldn't be any extraterrestrials because there aren't any habitable planets out there for them to live on. And what's the second prong of their main argument? It's based on the fact that Ross is a progressive creationist. Uh, in conjunction with that, he believes that evolution is naturally impossible. He believes that abiogenesis, or the emergence of life from non-living matter, is mathematically impossible, so life should not have arisen anywhere in the universe, not even on Earth. The only reason we have life on Earth here is because God specially created it through miraculous action. So he concludes that there also shouldn't be any extraterrestrials because they could never have evolved. And what's the third prong of their main argument? It's based on the distance between stars. Uh, Ross holds that there shouldn't be any aliens visiting Earth because the stars are just too far away to allow them to visit. Ross believes and states that it's impossible to travel faster than light, he doesn't believe that aliens could use time dilation effects to get here in a single lifetime because of how heavy and difficult it would be to bring fuel and supplies, and because he thinks there are practical barriers to getting up to the fraction of the speed of light that you'd need to for serious time dilation effects to kick in. And he doesn't believe that generational ships where you travel slower over many generations are feasible. So he concludes that even if extraterrestrials existed, they couldn't get here. Their main argument against the extraterrestrial hypothesis is thus extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because there aren't any habitable planets for them to come from. Extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because they couldn't evolve even if there were habitable planets. And extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because there is no way for them to get here. Therefore, the hypothesis that extraterrestrials explain UFOs and alien reports must be false. Let's go through his argument and evaluate its parts. What do you make of the first claim, that there aren't any habitable planets out there? Well, the first thing I'd say is this is just Ross's opinion, and it's not at all something that is universal among astronomers. There are many astronomers who think that there may be lots of habitable planets out there. We're always hearing about new exoplanets that have been discovered in their star's habitable zones, and exoplanets that have liquid water. Furthermore, many have begun to suspect that there may be many, many more habitable places in the universe besides just planets, because moons also may be capable of supporting life, even farther away from a sun's liquid water zone than you would think. For example, Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus both have oceans of liquid water. It's kept liquid by the gravitational forces of the planets they're orbiting, and there are big questions right now about whether these moons may harbor life. In fact, in 2021, NASA announced that they detected large amounts of methane, as well as dihydrogen and carbon dioxide, on Enceladus, and that this can't be explained by known geochemical processes. So it's been proposed that this is actually evidence of microbial life on Enceladus, which would explain these findings. Then there's the fact that we have pretty good evidence for life on Mars, as we talked about in episode 179, and especially in episode 180, both of which dealt with the possibility of life on Mars. So there are multiple bodies besides Earth in our own solar system that are thought to have the possibility of harboring life. The truth is that there is a spectrum of opinion among astronomers about how common habitable locations are in the galaxy, and Hugh Ross is at one extreme far end of that spectrum, with many astronomers excited about the possibility of multiple habitable locations here in our own solar system. Ross is definitely not in the majority of scientists who specialize in this field. Then there's the fact that even though life needs a planet or moon to start on, it doesn't have to stay there. Life, is, and especially intelligent life, can make new habitable zones for itself, like space stations or the colonies that Elon Musk is planning to make on Mars. So you don't need for habitable planets or moons to be common. 
Even if they're rare, if life gets started on any of them, it may make new habitable zones for itself. And studies have been done indicating that over the course of a million years, a species could colonize the galaxy. So even if naturally habitable planets or moons are rare, intelligent life might not be, because intelligent life might make new artificially habitable environments for itself. Finally, there is one argument that I consider absolutely fatal to Ross's rare earth argument. Even if you grant that, contrary to what seems to be the position of most astronomers, that Ross is right, that habitable locations are so uncommon that they simply will not occur naturally, so what? Since earth is habitable, it shouldn't exist, but it does because God created it and made it habitable. But if God can do that here on Earth, he can do that elsewhere. Therefore, the statistical improbability of naturally habitable planets means nothing. No matter what forces of nature would produce on their own, God can create as many habitable places as he chooses. And so there might be any number of habitable planets out there. Consequently, Ross's argument from the improbability of ha ha inhabitable planets occurring naturally simply fails. God can make as many of them as he chooses. What about the argument that extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because they couldn't evolve, even if they had habitable planets? What do you make of that? I also find it unpersuasive. There are apologists who argue that the chance of life arising from non-life, a process known as abiogenesis, is so statistically improbable that it would not occur naturally anywhere in the universe, and therefore God must have caused it to happen here on Earth. However, this also is not the majority opinion among scientists. Many of them would hold that it is possible for life to get started elsewhere. Uh, Christian scientists would say that that's part of God's providence and how he set up the laws of nature to operate in his universe to make this possible. The truth is that we don't know how common it is for life to arise from non-life. If you want to say that it's so improbable only God can do it, well, fine. But that doesn't tell us anything anything about how often God has done it. This argument thus has the same fatal objection that the previous one does. Even if you grant Ross's premise that God must intervene directly in an overt, miraculous way to cause life, that doesn't tell us how often God has made the decision to do that. Therefore, God may have made the decision to create life on lots of planets or moons, just as he did here. Uh, he may have had that life develop into intelligent life forms, either miraculously or non-miraculously. And further, once life starts somewhere, it doesn't have to stay there. As we've already discussed on the show before, it may well be the case that life on Earth ended up getting transplanted to Mars, for example, by extremophile microbes, ones that live in extreme conditions and could hitch a ride on meteors like the Martian meteorites we found here on Earth, and Earth meteorites that have undoubtedly gone to Mars. And Martian life may similarly have hitched a ride to Earth. So once God creates life on a planet or moon, it may spread to other planets and moons. It may even spread between solar systems, especially if that moon or planet is located in or near a stellar nursery and then drifts to another location. So, Ross's argument from the improbability of non-divine evolution on other planets also simply fails. Even if you grant his premise that evolution won't happen on its own, God could have chosen to intervene miraculously and create life and intelligent life on lots of planets, just like he did here. Then, what about the argument that extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because there's no way for them to get here? This argument has two components. First, that extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because faster-than-light travel is impossible. And second, that extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because slower-than-light travel between star systems is impractical. With regard to the first component, Ross simply takes it for granted. He flatly states that faster-than-light travel is impossible. But this is not at all a universal opinion among physicists. For example, 
Here's what physicist Michio Kaku says in the preface to his book, The Physics of the Impossible. So many technologies in science fiction are dismissed by scientists as being totally impossible, when what they actually mean is that they are impossible for a primitive civilization like ours. Alien visitations, for example, are usually considered impossible because the distances between the stars are so vast. While interstellar travel for our civilization is clearly impossible, it may be possible for a civilization centuries to thousands or millions of years ahead of ours. Technologies that are impossible for our current civilization are not necessarily impossible for other types of civilizations. Statements about what is possible and impossible have to take into account technologies that are millennia to millions of years ahead of ours. Later in the book, Kaku has a whole chapter devoted to faster-than-light travel, or FTL, and how it might work. Now, Kaku published his book in 2008, 15 years ago, and since then there has been even more discussion among physicists about how FTL could work. For example, here's physicist Sabina Hassenfelder. I believe there's intelligent life on other planets, and the most plausible reason why they haven't contacted us is that we're too boring. I mean, we haven't even figured out how to send information faster than light. Pathetic! But wait, let me guess. You've heard that it's impossible to send information faster than the speed of light because physics? Yes, I've heard that too, but I think it's wrong. And in this video, I want to explain why. Is it possible to break the speed of light limit? That's what we'll talk about today. Hassenfelder then goes on to discuss why she thinks arguments that sending information or traveling faster than light don't work. Also, there are current proposals for how faster-than-light travel might work that are on the table. In 1994, just as Star Trek The Next Generation was ending, Mexican physicist Miguel Alcubierre published a paper in which he proposed how a Star Trek-like warp drive could work. Astrophysicist Matt O'Dowd explains, In 1915, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity revealed that the fabric of space and time is mutable and dynamic. It can, in fact, be warped. You can't travel through space at faster than the speed of light, but there's no speed limit for the fabric of space itself. This hints at a possibility for faster than light or superluminal travel. And Star Trek inspired the very first real warp field solution to the Einstein field equations of general relativity. That's the Alcubierre warp field derived by Mexican physicist and Star Trek aficionado Miguel Alcubierre. Einstein's speed limit doesn't directly say that nothing can travel faster than light. His special theory of relativity just says that it takes infinite energy to accelerate anything with positive mass all the way to light speed. That effectively means that it's impossible to observe a massive object cross this speed barrier. But there are loopholes. In certain circumstances, we can think of space itself as moving. And there's no limit to the relative motion of two patches of space. And so objects in these patches could have superluminal speeds relative to each other. For example, inside black holes, we can think of space as flowing downwards faster than light. Or beyond the cosmic horizon, the expanding universe is carrying galaxies away from us faster than light. The warp drive takes advantage of this loophole by accelerating a patch of space relative to its surroundings. Objects in that warp bubble move with that patch without themselves ever feeling any acceleration. This is what the Alcubierre drive is supposed to do. It's a space-time geometry that's a valid solution to the equations of general relativity, the Einstein field equations. It includes a comfortable flat region of space surrounded by a region of extreme spatial curvature. The space behind this bubble is expanded while the space in front is contracted. The resulting push-pull propels the bubble and any spaceship that it contains. So Alcubierre discovered a solution that was consistent with Einstein's equations that would allow things to move faster than light in relative terms. Of course, there are issues with this proposal that remain to be solved, and in recent years there has been increasing discussion of how they might be solved. Sabina Hassenfelder explains, Warp drives are not just science fiction. Einstein's theory of general relativity says they should be possible. Yes, that guy again. 
A year ago, I told you about some recent developments and since then, warp drives have been in the news several times. In one case, the headlines claimed that a physicist had found a warp drive that makes faster than light travel possible without requiring unphysical negative energies. In another case, you could read that a warp drive pioneer had discovered an actual real-world warp bubble. The man who claims to have invented an actual warp bubble is the inventor Salvatore Pais, who works for the U.S. Navy. And the Navy has gone to bat for him with the U.S. Patent Office to try to get his inventions patented. We discussed Salvatore Pais, for example, back in our 100th episode, Mysterious Celebration. But whether or not Pais has come up with a real warp bubble, it's clear that multiple physicists are taking the possibility of faster-than-light travel seriously today. And, as Matt O'Dowd explains, These studies have made one thing very clear. If warp travel is possible, humanity will figure it out. Scientists are very persistent, especially the ones who are also diehard science fiction fans. They'll continue to try to make it so. By exploring Einstein's theory, hoping to build a starship, but in the process, learning how our universe works, and possibly also building a starship to propel humanity into the galaxy on waves of warped space-time. Hugh Ross's flat declaration that traveling faster than light is simply impossible is thus not the opinion of many physicists. They think it may be a real possibility. In which case, the first and most important component of Ross's argument that extraterrestrials can't be visiting Earth because faster-than-light travel is impossible fails. And Ross doesn't do anything to respond to the physicists who have a contrary opinion. He just ignores the possibility of moving faster-than-light and discussions of it in modern physics. What about the second component of his argument? that they can't be visiting because slower-than-light travel is impractical. This is even more problematic. We already know how to make slower-than-light travel between star systems work. There are multiple designs for slower-than-light ways to travel between them, and Ross doesn't deny this. Instead, his argument is that these means of travel are impractical. For example, he argues that you couldn't accelerate to a large enough percentage of the speed of light to travel between star systems in a single lifetime. But that assumes a human lifetime. Other species might live much longer than us. They might even have cracked the problem of aging and be functionally immortal, or be unfallen and completely immortal. He also dismisses multi-generational ships as a possibility, But in dismissing them, he's relying on the aliens being psychologically like us. I mean, yes, it might be iffy that humans would undertake a generations-long mission, but aliens might be totally willing to do so. We can't count on their psychology being like ours. Also, they might travel in suspended animation, which is something we're already working on, how to induce human hibernation. In fact, the aliens might even hibernate naturally, like bears and some other Earth creatures do. And as far as I can tell, Ross completely ignores another possibility, which is that you could send a robotic ship to another star system, and then when it arrives, you grow new biological life forms to complete the mission, or you build biological robots, or you build non-biological robots to do the mission. So there are multiple reasons why Ross's slower-than-light argument just doesn't work. So how would you summarize your analysis of Ross's case against the extraterrestrial hypothesis? I think it fails on every front. First, with regard to the argument that there won't be any naturally habitable places in the universe, that's out of step with mainstream scientific opinion. And even if he turned out to be right about that, This in no way stops God from deliberately creating habitable spaces elsewhere. He obviously created a habitable place here, and he can do so elsewhere if he chooses. Second, regarding the argument that aliens couldn't naturally evolve, this is also out of step with mainstream scientific opinion. And if Ross turned out to be right about this, it in no way stops God from deliberately putting life, including intelligent life, on other planets. He did so here and he can do so elsewhere if he chooses. Third, and finally, regarding the argument that aliens can't be visiting us because it would be impossible for them to get here, 
Ross is ignoring the many physicists who think faster than light travel may be a real possibility. And even if it turns, if it, even if this turns out not to be the case, there are multiple ways that aliens could get here by slower than light travel. So I think Ross's argument against the extraterrestrial hypothesis that UFOs might be intelligent aliens simply falls flat. It depends on elements that are outside of mainstream scientific opinion, and it ignores God's power and freedom to do what he chooses to do elsewhere. So their argument that extraterrestrials can't be responsible for UFOs simply doesn't work at all. However, we still need to consider their arguments in favor of their version of the interdimensional hypothesis. And before we get to that, we do want to stop and take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Eric E., Brian S., Michael P., Brian K., and James H. Their generous donations at sqpn.com give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at gradygroupinc.com. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. Jimmy, let's turn to the argument that Ross and Samples make in favor of their version of the interdimensional hypothesis. What do they have to say on the topic? To introduce this subject, I need to explain a term that Ross uses. The term in question is RUFOs, which is short for residual UFOs. A residual UFO is one that remains unaccounted for when we eliminate those reports that have conventional causes. Uh, there's nothing exotic about a UFO if it turns out to be a hoax or a misperception of natural phenomena like stars, satellites, meteors, or swamp gas, or if it turns out to be a classified government project. But when you eliminate such conventionally caused UFOs, there is a remainder, and the ones that remain apparently have a more exotic cause. Ross refers to these as residual UFOs or RUFOs. In the book, he introduces this term as if everybody uses it. However, this term is not in general use in the UFO community. I've never encountered it. And after I did online searching and didn't turn it up in conventional UFO O authors. They just weren't using it. So it appears that this is either a term that Ross has just made up himself or that it's one that's only used in circles that he's part of. But that doesn't make it a bad term. There are residual UFOs that can't be explained conventionally. I just wish he hadn't implied that the term was in general use when it's not. In any event, one of the things that Samples and Ross do is make an appeal to authority. They point out that some UFO researchers like the American author John Keel and the French ufologist Jacques Vallée are supporters of the interdimensional hypothesis. And that's fine as far as it goes. Keel and Vallée both have devoted considerable study to UFOs, so this isn't a fallacious appeal to authority. It's a logical fallacy if you appeal to someone as an authority on something that they haven't studied, like appealing to Albert Einstein as an authority for medical advice when Einstein wasn't a medical doctor. But both Keel and Vallée have studied UFOs, so this isn't an outright logical fallacy. And Keel and Vallée's opinions need to be considered, so we will be covering both of them in future episodes. But there are still two problems with their appeal to UFO researchers like this. Now, what's the first problem? that neither Keel nor Vallée agree with the kind of interdimensional hypothesis that Samples and Ross are advocating. Keel and Vallée may think that UFOs, or at least many UFOs, come from another dimension. But that dimension isn't heaven or hell. They would not agree that UFOs are just demons and that that's all there is to it. 
In fact, Valet would tend to see the causal arrow pointing in the other direction, and he has proposed that things commonly regarded as religious phenomena should be viewed in non-religious terms. For example, he has proposed that the Dance of the Sun at 1917 in Fatima, Portugal, which was part of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, may have really been a UFO. And he has proposed that other Marian apparitions are also possibly UFO encounters. So he's inclined to see religious phenomena explained in terms of non-religious UFO phenomena, and thus not inclined to endorse the idea that UFOs are simply demons, with all the conceptual content that that word would involve for Christians. Ross and Samples are thus citing authorities for the interdimensional hypothesis who don't agree with their own demonic hypothesis. What's the second problem with Ross and Samples' citation of others who favor the interdimensional hypothesis? They misrepresent how common it is. At one point, Ross writes, Many other scholars have deduced that demons dwell behind residual UFO phenomena. Most research scientists involved with serious study of RUFOs regardless of religious or philosophical perspective, have either drawn the same conclusion or identified an equivalent cause, for example, malevolent beings from another dimension. This is completely misleading. It is flatly false to say many other scholars have deduced that demons are responsible for UFOs. That is a hypothesis that is found basically exclusively in the Christian community. And there aren't many explicitly Christian ufologists, especially not ones that could be considered scholars. Also, you'll note how they try to blur the line between the demonic hypothesis and other versions of the interdimensional hypothesis. They say that most research scientists involved with serious study of UFOs have regardless of religious or philosophical perspective, either drawn the same conclusion or identified an equivalent cause, meaning, of, for example, malevolent beings from another dimension. Except that this also appears to be flatly false. Here he's talking about research scientists involved with serious study of residual UFOs. And while I've never seen a statistical survey of this question, and I'm quite sure Ross hasn't either, it just appears not to be the case that most of these people have concluded that UFOs are demons or an equivalent like malevolent interdimensionals. In fact, the interdimensional hypothesis is far from being the most prominent one in the UFO community. That continues to be the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Some ufologists are open to both the extraterrestrial hypothesis and the interdimensional hypothesis, and some are open to the time travel hypothesis and even the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis. But it would be inaccurate to say that most research scientists who have looked into UFOs support the malevolent interdimensionals idea. Unless you use terms like research scientists and involved with serious study as weasel words to exclude the people whose views you don't want to consider. In fact, I suspect that's exactly what Ross is doing. Why should we only count the views of research scientists, meaning scientists who do active research in a field, when there are lots of people who have, you know, who do experiments, when there are lots of people who have done serious study of UFOs who may not be regularly engaged in experimental projects in other scientific disciplines. And the phrase serious study seems designed to exclude anyone who disagrees on the grounds that, well, he hasn't studied seriously enough. When Jacques Vallée began proposing his non-demonic understanding of the interdimensional hypothesis, he actually got a lot of pushback from ufologists who were supporters of the dominant extraterrestrial hypothesis. Ufologists are marginalized by the scientific community already, so they were already outcasts, kind of like heretics. And for his advocacy of the interdimensional hypothesis, Vallée was marginalized even among, you, uh, even among ufologists, so he described himself as a heretic among heretics. It thus appears false to imply that the interdimensional hypothesis has been embraced as a firm conclusion by the key people who have studied UFOs. That's just an exaggeration 
to make Ross's case sound more mainstream than it is. The majority of responsible ufologists aren't convinced of the interdimensional hypothesis and are open to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. While appealing to authorities is interesting, what really counts is the evidence that can be cited for a position. Does Ross cite evidence favoring his understanding of the interdimensional hypothesis? At one point, Ross argues in favor of it by saying that residual UFOs must be non-physical entities because of the characteristics they display. If, and if they're non-physical, that would suggest they're not from our physical universe and would be interdimensional. He lists 15 characteristics that he thinks indicate that they are non-physical, and he writes, It seems evident that RUFOs must be non-physical because they disobey firmly established physical laws. Unlike physical entities, RUFOs typically exhibit the following characteristics. 1. RUFOs leave no physical artifacts even after crashing. 2. They generate no sonic booms when they break the sound barrier, nor do they show any evidence of meeting with air resistance. 3. They may be seen but not photographed, or they may be photographed, though never with high resolution, but not seen. In fact, the resolution of a UFO image may change from one moment to the next. 4. RUFOs may be detected by radar but not seen, or they may be seen but not detected by radar. 5. They make impossibly sharp turns and sudden stops and impossibly rapid accelerations to speeds approaching 15,000 miles per hour. 6. RUFOs hover above ground or harm buildings and trees without any movement of air. No downward rush or other movement counter to ambient air currents. 7. They change momentum without yielding an opposite change of momentum in matter or in an energy field either coupled to the object or in the vicinity of the object. 8. They change shape, size, and color at random. 9. RUFOs suddenly disappear and reappear, or they disintegrate and reintegrate. 10. They send no detectable electromagnetic signals. 11. They emit light that casts no shadows. They project light beams of finite length or emit some light that twinkles and other light that does not. They change the apparent color of people, objects, or vehicles they spotlight. 12. They sometimes remain indistinguishable in shape despite close observation. 13. RUFOs consistently succeed in evasive action, sometimes vanishing instantly or at other times seeming to enter the ground without leaving a trace. 14. They melt asphalt and metal objects and burn grass and leaves without fire or flame. 15. They physically injure and even kill human observers apart from any identifiable physical agent. This list sounds convincing when you first hear it. I mean, you know, sounds convincing, right? UFOs must be non-physical. But now we're going to go back over those characteristics one by one and see whether they really would indicate that UFOs are non-physical. But before we do that, I'd like to note how Ross introduces the list. He said that RUFOs typically exhibit the following characteristics. As we're going to see, this is flatly not true for some of the characteristics he names. To say that UFOs typically do something means they do it a lot, perhaps even a majority of the time. Like if you say humans typically sleep at night, that would be true of most humans most of the time. But some of the characteristics he names UFOs displaying are rarely reported at best. Some of them are things that almost never happen in UFO reports, and that raises questions about the accuracy of the reports. Because while rare things do happen in the world, reports of rare things can also indicate that a report is mistaken. Like, if you heard a report of a human who has not slept in 20 years, well, that would be a very rare thing if it were true, but it's more likely that the report is just erroneous. As we heard back in episode 98 on the mystery of sleep, humans just cannot survive that long without sleep. For example, there's a genetic condition known as fatal familial insomnia, and once the disease activates, people lose their ability to sleep over a period of nine months. Once that happens, they then die within another nine months 
So you can survive without sleep with hallucinations, panic attacks, and paranoia for only a few months. There's no way you'd be able to survive for 20 years without sleep, so any such report is likely erroneous. This is why, when evaluating statistical evidence, scientists often set aside data points that are outliers, things that are way outside the rest of the data points they have, because they may be erroneous data points. But Ross isn't doing that with his 15 characteristics. Instead, he's apparently read some reports of UFOs doing really rare things, and he doesn't even provide references to document these claims, so you can't look them up. Instead, he not only takes all of these accounts at face value and assumes they're true, he also sloppily characterizes them as common things, as things UFOs typically do, which is inexcusably sloppy and, frankly, conduct unbecoming to an actual scientist. As before, he's exaggerating to bolster his case. So, with that as background, let's go through his 15 characteristics. Uh, Number one. Rufos leave no physical artifacts, even after crashing. What Ross appears to have in mind here is a case or a handful of cases where a UFO was seen heading towards the ground and appeared to crash into the ground, yet there was no physical debris afterwards. But that's consistent with the idea that UFOs are from another physical dimension. If they're physical beings flying a physical craft, their craft must have the ability to shift between dimensions. So maybe they just shifted to another dimension before hitting the ground. They thus could be physical objects that just shifted dimensions at the last second. The purported characteristic thus would not support Ross's claim that they are not physical. Then there's the prob- there's a problem with the claim itself. First, they are widely reported to leave physical artifacts when they land, Uh, you know, effects on their environment. We heard about that in episode 231 on the Lani Zamora, Socorro, New Mexico UFO encounter. After he saw the landed UFO take off, Officer Zamora found physical depressions in the ground from its landing gear, and the desert scrub was smoldering and smoking from the physical flame he saw the craft emit. Physical trace cases like this are so common that they fall within J. Allen Hynek's category known as close encounters of the second kind, whereby a UFO is seen close up and it interacts with its environment, such as by leaving physical traces in that environment. Second, UFOs have also been reported to leave parts of themselves behind. Sometimes they are reported to discharge these parts while still in the air, and sometimes they explode and scatter parts. Uh, We heard about cases like this back in episode 207 on UFO debris and arts parts. Third, some who encounter UFOs report having physical implants left in their bodies, as we heard about in episode 80 on alien implants. And fourth, when it comes to crashing, dude, Roswell. Now, I don't think Roswell was an alien craft, as we discussed back in episode 49, but I don't see how you can baldly say UFOs leave no physical artifacts even after crashing. UFOs are widely reported to leave such debris, including UFOs that don't have apparent natural explanations and are residual. For example, there was the recent case of UFO whistleblower David Grush who said the U.S. alone has material from 12 such craft, as we discussed in episode 264B. So, I think the claim that residual UFOs don't leave artifacts is simply false, according to the reports. Furthermore, in their book, Samples and Ross acknowledge trace cases like this. So, I don't know how Ross can simply say that they don't happen among residual UFOs. Elsewhere in the book, they make a big point that they do happen. Ross is just cherry-picking cases that he thinks favor his argument, even though they don't. And then he's overgeneralizing the characteristic to all residual UFOs and ignoring evidence to the contrary from other cases that he and Samples mention in their own book. All right. Two, they generate no sonic booms when they break the sound barrier, no, nor do they show any evidence of meeting with air resistance. 
So maybe they have advanced technology that allows them to avoid this. In other episodes, like episode 207 on UFO debris, we already discussed metamaterials, which are materials that have been engineered on the level of the very small to have unusual optical, electrical, or acoustical properties. And as we heard, some UFO debris appear to be metamaterials. So maybe UFOs are covered with metamaterials that allow them to have decreased air resistance and avoid making sonic booms. Or maybe they're surrounded by some kind of energy field that pushes the air away from them in a way that does this. 3. They may be seen, but not photographed, or they may be photographed, though never with high resolution, but not seen. In fact, the resolution of a UFO image may change from one moment to the next. It's unfortunate that Ross doesn't provide any documentation for his list of characteristics. This characteristic is jumbled, and it is difficult to know what he's thinking about. It's true that sometimes UFOs are seen but not photographed, and that's because sometimes people see them but don't have a camera with them, or because they forget to use the camera, or because the camera malfunctions. But none of that requires that UFOs be non-physical. It's also true that UFOs are sometimes photographed, and usually not with high resolution, because most people aren't carrying high-resolution long-distance lenses with their phones or other cameras, and because UFOs are usually seen in the distance. However, it does appear that they have been photographed in high resolution. Uh, this apparently happened in the 2004 Tic Tac incident off the coast of San Diego that we heard about in episode 70, which was our Navy ATIP update. The USS Nimitz carrier group that encountered the Tic Tac was loaded to the teeth with the best combat sensing equipment that we have. And that would include high-resolution cameras, such as on the fighter jets that encountered the Tic Tac. We thus should have high-resolution gun camera footage of the object, only that footage hasn't been declassified, only the low-resolution footage has been, so that our global competitors don't know how good our camera equipment is. What Ross appears to be thinking of here are cases where someone saw and took pictures of a UFO but other witnesses who were present didn't see it. At least that's part of what he's describing in this characteristic. Well, that could be due to a number of factors, such as other witnesses just weren't looking in the right direction. Or the UFO was small and in the distance, and some of the witnesses had bad eyesight, or they just didn't look quickly enough. But I'm not aware of any credible UFO reports where someone saw and photographed a UFO and other people were standing nearby looking at the right time in the right direction and with good eyesight and still didn't see anything. If there are such cases, they're outliers. In other words, they're rare among UFO reports, and outliers may be erroneous reports. Finally, Ross says that sometimes the resolution of a UFO image may change from moment to moment. That easily could be because of operator error when using the camera, or a problem with the camera itself, like it's adjusting its focus, or because the UFO has technology that makes it blurry, like the exhaust of a jet can disturb the air and make its image blurrier, or it's moving fast and so it looks blurry. Well, UFOs may have something similar, or because they're surrounded by some kind of energy field that changes, or because they accelerate and that blurs the image, or because they transition to another physical dimension and that affects the image. None of these provide good evidence that UFOs are non-physical. Here, Ross is awkwardly stitching together a bunch of things that all have explanations consistent with the idea that these are physical craft, and none of them are inconsistent with the idea that UFOs are physical. 4. RUFOs may be detected by radar but not seen, or they may be seen but not detected by radar. First, as for the cases where they're detected by radar but not seen, this could be because radar returns are erroneous and aren't detecting UFOs at all. Radars are known to have erroneous readings from time to time. Or perhaps they it's just dark and the UFO isn't glowing at the moment, so the radar could see it, but people standing on the ground didn't. 
Or perhaps the people standing on the ground didn't know where to look, or the UFO was hidden by a cloud, or the UFO was too far away in the sky to be easily visible and distinguishable from a star. Maybe f for cases where they are seen but not detected by radar, you know, maybe they just have some kind of advanced stealth that they can turn on. And maybe like a Klingon cloaking device, they can't use this stealth technology at the same time they're doing other things. So they have to shut it off for some tasks, like Klingons have to decloak before firing their weapons. And so if UFOs have this kind of on-off stealth technology, they would sometimes be visible to radar and sometimes not, depending on what mode they're in. Five, they make impossibly sharp turns and sudden stops and impossibly rapid accelerations to speeds approaching 15,000 miles per hour. All this means is that they have more advanced aerospace tech than we do. Before the Wright brothers' historic flight near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903, we were limited to balloons and dirigibles. The heavier-than-air flight that the Wright brothers accomplished was considered impossible by many. And when you look at what we're able to do now with hypersonic airplanes that can go many times the speed of sound, what we can do now, 120 years into powered flight, would have been considered absolutely impossible in the past. So if you imagine a civilization with a thousand years more of more powered flight than we have, the argument that UFOs make dramatically sharp turns, sudden stops, and rapid accelerations is not unexpected. And you'd expect that with a thousand more years of research into powered flight. And the idea that speeds approaching 15,000 miles an hour is somehow physically impossible is nonsense. That's not even 20 times the speed of sound, or Mach 20. Uh, well, the Defense Advanced Research Department Agency, or DARPA, has already created a hypersonic aircraft that can fly at Mach 20 with today's technology. It's called the Falcon HTV-2, and we'll have a link to it so you can read about it for yourself. So, ooh. 15,000 miles per hour, that must be a non-physical craft, is just nonsense. 6. Rufos hover above ground or harm buildings and trees without any movement of air, no downward rush or other movement counter to ambient air currents. First, let's deal with the idea of UFOs hovering with no downward rush of air. You'd only expect to have a downward rush of air if an aircraft were moving forward, which isn't the case if it's hovering, or if it's using a reaction motor that expels air or something to keep it in the sky, like the blades of a helicopter push on the air to keep it aloft. But maybe they're using something different. NASA has already been testing a possible reactionless drive, one that doesn't release or push on stuff. It's known as the M-Drive. So maybe UFOs are just using a successful reactionless drive along those lines. Or maybe they have superconductors and the power needed to levitate using the Earth's magnetic field, a phen phenomenon known as magnetic levitation. Or maybe they've developed genuine anti-gravity. Or maybe they're just lighter than air, like balloons or dirigibles, and they're using sideways thrusters to keep themselves in place and not be blown about by the wind. Whatever the case, we don't have compelling evidence that they are non-physical just because they can hover without creating a breeze on the ground or being blown about by the wind. What about Ross's claim that they can harm buildings and trees without any movements of air? That's certainly not typical of UFOs. It's not typical for them to harm buildings or trees. Reports of things like that are rare. So here Ross is exaggerating again. But you don't need to move air to harm things on the ground. You, for example, you could use an X-ray laser, one that doesn't operate in the visible part of the light spectrum. And it could harm things on the ground without moving air around. And that's just one possibility. There are numerous others. 7. They change momentum without yielding an opposite change of momentum in matter or in an energy field, either coupled to the object or in the vicinity of the object. This seems to be just another way of saying that they have unusual flight characteristics. But so what? In a thousand years, we will have aircraft with unusual flight characteristics too. There's no evidence of being fundamentally non-physical here. 
Certainly, we don't have evidence that residual UFOs, quote, must be non-physical, close quote, as Ross said. 8. They change shape, size, and color at random. Saying that they do so at random is just Ross exaggerating again. While we do have reports of some UFOs changing shape, we don't have enough data to establish whether they're doing it randomly or whether they're doing it according to some pattern. All you can really say is we have evidence of some UFOs changing shape. They may change size to some extent, for reasons we'll get into, and some may only appear to change size when really what they're doing is just getting closer or farther away, making them look bigger or smaller. Uh, Some also may appear to change color, for example, by turning on different kinds of lights, uh, just like our airplanes have different colored lights on them that they may turn on and off. We use them to let observers know which part of the aircraft they're looking at, but they could have other uses for aliens. And colored lights could be due to other systems on the craft that they may turn on or off. Changing size and color are no big deal, especially at night, since our own primitive airplanes use colored lights at night. What's more interesting is changing shape. This is reported with some UFOs, but You know what else changes shape, at least in a small way? Our own standard airplanes. Sometimes, if you're watching an airplane flying, particularly low in the sky, you'll notice that the underside of the plane is smooth and flat. But then, all of a sudden, this shape starts changing. Things that look kind of like doors open up, and protrusions come out, and the protrusions have shapes like short horizontal cylinders on them. And then the plane makes contact with the ground, and it supports itself using these protrusions. And you see the opposite of all this when the plane takes off. It starts sitting on the ground with the protrusions out, but once it gets off the ground, it retracts its landing gear, and the doors close over it to give it a smooth undercarriage. And this isn't the only part of a plane, a standard plane, that changes shape. YouTube channel Xeroth explains... Conventional plane wings are carefully designed to generate lift. The shape of the wing, known as an aerofoil, is key to this process. As air flows over the wing, it creates a difference in pressure between the upper and lower surfaces, ultimately resulting in lift. But what happens when a pilot needs to control an aircraft's speed, altitude, or angle of attack during takeoff, landing, or other maneuvers? This is where flaps come in. Flaps are hinged surfaces located on the trailing edge of the wing. They can be extended or retracted to modify a wing shape and alter its aerodynamic performance to increase lift for takeoff, increase drag to slow for landing, or improve control and maintain stability. So yeah, even normal aircraft change shape in small ways by maneuvering their flaps or by raising and lowering their landing gear. And today, they're working on wings that change shape in more significant ways. Interestingly though, the first ever aircraft wings from the Wright brothers didn't actually have flaps. In fact, it was actually a kind of metamorphic wing. These were called warping wings and mimicked a bird's wing form. In practice, since most wing warping designs involved flexing of structural members, these were difficult to control and liable to cause structural failure. However, thanks to modern materials and technologies, shape-shifting wings are making a comeback. Metamorphic aerofoils are adaptive wings that can change their shape depending on the flight conditions. Think of them as a transformer wing that, similarly to flaps, are designed to optimize performance, efficiency, and maneuverability. However, because of their shape and precision, they can actually do these things even better than conventional flaps. These amazing wings work using cutting edge technology like shape memory alloys, smart materials, and advanced actuators. When specific conditions are detected, these components work together to change the aerofoil shape, allowing the aircraft to adapt to its environment. The first shape-shifting wing is called the fishbone active camber morphing structure or fishback for short. This biologically inspired concept consists of four main elements. A compliant skeleton core, a pretensioned compliant skin, a pair of tendons coupled to a spooling pulley, and a non-morphing main spar. Testing was performed in a wind tunnel at Swansea University in Wales, 
and they've found that there can be significant reductions in drag whilst retaining the same lift, meaning the fishback metamorphic wing can have 125% the aerodynamic efficiency of a standard flap controlled wing. The next wing is this morphing aerofoil design by Ruwu at the University of Manchester. The wing is also inspired by the tail of a fish, and the results they have achieved are extremely impressive. This small scale prototype shows it in action. In the finalized wing, the innovative structure will be driven by an electrical actuation system that uses linear ultrasonic motors. An ultrasonic motor is a type of electric motor that produces its motion through ultrasonic vibrations, enabling electrical energy to be converted into motion by the inverse piezoelectric effect. Testing of the wing showed that all morphing states provided a higher lift to drag ratio than conventional hinge controlled surfaces. So we're looking at shape changing the wings even more in the future with metamorphic wings. And there are even more dynamic shape changes already going on. There are also what are known as variable geometry aircraft or swing wings. These planes have wings that can take different positions. For example, they may start by being extended out directly from the body of the plane, but then in flight they are swung back to hug the body of the plane and decrease drag on the airplane as it pierces the air. We have these planes today, and the military uses them for a variety of purposes. So even modern aircraft change shape in various ways, and they're looking at having, change, having them change shape even more in the future. You certainly see similar things in science fiction. For example, if you've ever seen the opening credits of Star Trek Voyager, you'll see that Voyager typically has its warp nacelles extended out horizontally from the body of the ship, but then, just as it's preparing to go to warp, it raises these nacelles up. So Voyager is like a 24th century version of a modern 21st century swing wing aircraft. And if you jump ahead to the 32nd century in the third season of the truly awful Star Trek Discovery, you meet a character named Book, and Book's ship is even more radical in its variable geometry. It actually comes apart into pieces. The pieces fly forward, and then they reunite with each other, sometimes in a new shape. And frankly, that's tame compared to what you'd expect in the actual 32nd century. Because right now, in the 21st, we're working on what's called programmable matter, also known as smart matter, which is matter that you can program to take different shapes. And you'd expect that in a thousand years' time, aircraft also would likely to be made of programmable smart matter and be able to change their shape to fit the needs of whatever circumstances they're in at the moment. So I don't find Ross's claim that UFOs must be non-physical because they change shape at all plausible. Our aircraft do that now, and they're likely to do it even more in the future. 9. Rufos suddenly disappear and reappear, or they disintegrate and reintegrate. First, Regarding the ability of residual UFOs to appear and disappear, this could be due to a number of things. It could be due to their ability to move very suddenly in the blink of an eye. They might suddenly move away and then suddenly move back. Or it might be slightly more exotic than that. We're already working on technology using metamaterials to produce invisibility. It's known as metamaterial cloaking. And we'll have a link to an article so you can read about it. So maybe UFOs have a metamaterial cloaking that they can use to turn visible or invisible as part of their stealth technology. That doesn't prove they're non-physical. We've got a primitive version of that technology today. And their ability to appear and disappear might be more exotic still. If they're coming from another physical dimension, they might be jumping back and forth between our universe and the other one. So I don't find Ross's argument that UFOs appear and disappear means they must be non-physical to be at all convincing. What about Ross's claim that UFOs disintegrate and reintegrate? What he's thinking about here are cases like, for example, when you see a group of lights that seem to be linked to each other, like the Phoenix lights that we discussed back in episode 30. And then one or more of the lights detaches and goes off and does stuff, and then it comes back and reunites with the others. 
You know what we'd call that kind of behavior today? Using a drone. It's hardly surprising if physical UFOs have physical drones that they send out to do stuff and then retrieve them. We actually see this behavior today with our own craft, um, though we're more familiar with it happening with watercraft than aircraft. For example, ships often carry small boats and submersibles and drones. When they get to where they want to go, they may send out these small boats, submersibles, and drones and then retrieve them. Jacques Cousteau would do that all the time. His ship, the Calypso, would always be sending out little boats to carry his divers to the shore or to dive sites. It would send out little submersibles, that you know, submarines, that were sometimes shaped like flying saucers. They were even called diving saucers. And the Calypso would have helicopters coming in and out all the time. It even had its own helicopter landing pad. And I've been on such remote craft myself. When Catholic Answers has had cruises to different locations, I've taken the main cruise ship to a port and then used a tender to get to shore and then used the tender to get back to the ship. So detaching things from a main craft and then reassembling them is something we already do. Uh, We've envisioned ships in the future doing it, like Book's ship in Star Trek Discovery or even just the Enterprise and its shuttlecraft probes and marker boys in the original series. So the idea that UFOs come apart and then come back together in no way proves that they are non-physical. This is yet another bad argument. 10. They send no detectable electromagnetic signals. This one is one where Ross seems to be exaggerating. First, it depends on what you mean by send electromagnetic signals. UFOs certainly reflect electromagnetic waves and thus send them in this sense. For example, they are often visible to the naked eye, and visible light is electromagnetic, so they're definitely reflecting electromagnetic waves. Sometimes they also reflect radar waves, which are another kind of electromagnetic signal, and sometimes they glow which means they emit light and thus do emit electromagnetic signals. What Ross must be thinking of here are electromagnetic signals on a different part of the spectrum, ones that aren't visible to the human eye or radar, like the radio waves that we use to communicate. Well, maybe UFOs communicate on a different band of the spectrum than we use. Or maybe they communicate with using a highly compressed data burst, so very short transmissions with a lot of silence between them, so that they aren't transmitting most of the time. Our military uses data burst transmission as part of radio silence. Or maybe they use lasers to communicate, in which case you'd or or some kind of coherent emission, in which case you'd only be able to pick up the signal if you were di- if they were directly pointing the laser at you, since laser beams are coherent and don't spread out the way standard radio waves do. Or maybe they just maintain radio silence. After all, if you're emitting signals in the bands that humans monitor, that makes you trackable. So as any part of a standard stealth protocol, radio silence would play a prominent role. And you'd also want to shield your craft from emitting stray signals on other frequencies that would make you trackable. So there are multiple reasons why humans might not pick up on communications traffic or similar signals from UFOs. And that's even granting Ross's claim that they don't emit non-visible EM signals. Frankly, I'd like to know how he makes that claim, whether there are reports to the contrary, and whether we'd really expect to have picked up such signals, given that most UFO witnesses don't have equipment with them that is capable of monitoring the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Once again, it seems to me that Ross is just sloppily exaggerating to bolster his case. 11. They emit light that casts no shadows. They project light beams of finite length or emit some light that twinkles and other light that does not. They change the apparent color of people, objects, or vehicles they spotlight. Here, Ross has bundled together a bunch of things, none of which are particularly impressive. Let's take them in reverse order. First, he says that they change the, quote, apparent color of people, objects, or vehicles they spotlight, close quote. Well, you know, shining a colored light on a person, object, or vehicle will do that. If I shine a purple light on a white van, 
it's going to make the white van appear to be purple. I've changed its apparent color. We now have home lighting systems, like with Hue smart bulbs, that are designed to change col the color of our walls inside our homes. Aliens may be doing something similar. That's not evidence that they're not physical. Um, I mean, for example, if you look in, in Dom's home office in the video version of the podcast, you'll see he's got a uh, hue light making his office have a bluish tint right now. My ceiling so, is not blue. <laughs> yeah. So we've got technology that does this and that's, and that's not evidence that Dom's office is not physical. So this isn't evidence that UFOs aren't physical, just that they've got something that can broadcast visible light on different frequencies, and we have that. Second, Ross says that they emit some light that twinkles and other light that does not. So Ross just admitted that they do emit electromagnetic, electromagnetic signals like light. Funny, he wasn't more consistent about that in his previous point, and again, that's more sloppiness on his part. But let's address the twinkling versus non-twinkling light. One way to make light twinkle is to broadcast it more brightly or dimly, or make parts of what you're broadcasting brighter or dimmer. And modern hue lighting systems do that. Um, so do what are sometimes called galaxy projectors or aurora lamps, which are entertainment systems that project stars and auroras and galaxies on your walls and ceiling. And by their nature, they shift and twinkle and make patterns of light that change, and they're doing that just for fun. Also, you can make a light twinkle if there's dust in the air that it's shining through, or if you drop small reflective things into the light. That's how they made the original transporter effect on Star Trek. They dropped glitter into a beam of light. But in any event, sending out light that twinkles sometimes and doesn't twinkle other times does not show that you're not physical. The two are just unrelated. Third, Ross says that they project beams of light of finite length, which is interesting because you'd normally expect a beam of light to just keep going until it hits an object. But Ross is claiming they do something like a Jedi turning on a lightsaber, where a visible beam of light only goes out so far and then stops. I'd like to know how just how many accounts there are of this, and what the atmospheric conditions were at the time. This may well be another case of Ross having heard of an outlier report or two that he now exaggerates and declares to be typical behavior of UFOs, even though they're just outlier reports that may not be accurate. Certainly, this doesn't seem to be typical from the reports I've read. But assuming that they are accurate, beams of light, including lasers, are only visible from the side if they're passing through something. So I'd like to know what the atmospheric conditions were. For example, was the UFO in a cloud or a bank of fog when it turned on a beam of light? In which case, we'd expect to see the beam of light extend as far as the water vapor in the cloud or fog, but then you wouldn't be able to see it beyond that. In that case, the apparent stopping of the beam would be only apparent, and it would be due to just chance circumstances. But it's also possible to make a light beam stop deliberately. In his book, The Physics of the Impossible, Michio Kaku has a section on how to build lightsabers, and he estimates that we could have functional ones within about 100 years. Finally, Ross says that UFOs emit light that does not produce shadows. Well, once again, is this really typical behavior for UFOs, or has Ross just heard a few outlier reports and is making it sound normal to bolster his case? Whatever is happening with that, whether a light produces a visible shadow depends entirely on the local lighting conditions. If a light is distant enough, diffuse enough, or dim enough, it may not cause you to de throw a detectable shadow, especially if the ground that you're standing on is complex and if there are other light sources in your area. So this claim isn't evidence of non-physicality, since lots of natural lights in various situations don't produce notable shadows. 12. They sometimes remain indistinguishable in shape despite close observation. I'm not entirely sure what Ross means here, and it's a pity he doesn't document what he's talking about to explain it more. 
but I think he means that sometimes UFOs look blurry even when you can observe them fairly closely. Well, that's not typical behavior of closely seen UFOs, even though Ross says it is. Once again, he's exaggerating. But if this is accurate, so what? Things can, that vibrate fast can be blurry, so UFOs might just be machines that vibrate fast. Or it might be part of a stealth technology that the UFO is using, like made a material cloaking to produce invisibility, or partial invisibility in this case, to make them harder to spot and analyze as targets. That's not proof of non-physicality, just of rapid vibration or advanced technology. 13. Rufos consistently succeed in evasive action, sometimes vanishing instantly or at other times seeming to enter the ground without leaving a trace. So the fact that residual UFOs are very good at evasion doesn't prove that they're non-physical, just that they're good at evasion, which is consistent with high tech. When it comes to them seeming to vanish instantly or enter the ground without leaving a trace, here Ross is double dipping. He's already mentioned these in previous items on the list, and we've already seen multiple ways that they could vanish instantly, and how, in a, a few outlier cases that Ross is exaggerating into being typical behavior, how they could appear to enter the ground without leaving a trace, like shifting into another physical dimension. Heck, we even saw that in the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Pegasus, where the Enterprise used a, phase, used a phasing cloak to enter an asteroid or get out of an asteroid. Of course, we don't know how to build a phasing cloak today, but if other physical dimensions exist and are crossable, we may well learn how to build one in the future. So the observed behavior is not proof that UFOs are non-physical. They might just have advanced tech. 14. They melt asphalt and metal objects and burn grass and leaves without fire or flame. You know what else does that? An X-ray laser. Our eyes don't detect the right part of the electromagnetic spectrum for X-rays, so an X-ray laser is invisible to our eyes, and if you shine one on plants, you won't see visible fire or flame stretching out to the plants. The plants themselves will just get singed or burned. So X-ray lasers do that. So will microwaves. So will a really intense heat lamp. So there are multiple options here, none of which require that UFOs be non-physical. 15. They physically injure and even kill human observers apart from any identifiable physical agent. Again, Ross is double-dipping. He's just shifted from talking about humans now rather than talking about asphalt, metal objects, and grass and leaves. Also, Ross is clearly, clearly exaggerating again. UFOs do not typically kill human observers. This is a rare situation if it happens at all. And if it happens, it may be unintentional. Any such fatalities may have been accidental rather than deliberate, like when the Enterprise almost killed Captain John Christopher in the original series episode Tomorrow is Yesterday, when they underestimated how much strain his 20th century fighter plane could take and almost crushed it with a tractor beam. In any event, you know what else will kill a human apart from an identifiable physical agent? An x-ray laser, or microwaves, or a really strong heat lamp, or an electric shock, or a bunch of nanobots, or a virus, or a poison. In fact, poison has been a preferred means of killing humans without an identifiable physical cause for most of human history, because before modern toxicology, it was very hard to detect the poison so you could kill someone secretly. So there are bunches of ways in which UFOs might intentionally or unintentionally kill human observers and yet be completely physical. I thus conclude that no matter how impressive Ross's list of characteristics sounds when you first hear it, it's a big nothing burger. It's filled with exaggeration on Ross's part of behaviors that are not typical of UFOs in the report literature. He's relying on outlier cases that may well be erroneous and just accepting them as accurate and exaggerating them into being typical behaviors to bolster his case. And in no case does he produce anything that is a clear indicator of non-physicality. All the things he names are either things we human beings are already doing 
or can do, or will soon be able to do, or may be able to do in the future. His case for non-physicality, like his case against the extraterrestrial hypothesis, falls flat. So let's talk about this issue now from the faith perspective. Hugh Ross and Ken Samples have more to their case than just attacking the extraterrestrial hypothesis and arguing that UFOs are non-physical. How do they argue that, in addition to being non-physical, UFOs are specifically demons? They seem to make four major arguments. First, based on the experiences of UFO contactees. Second, based on the experiences of UFO abductees. Third, the experiences of those involved in the New Age movement and the kinds of practices it uses. And fourth, the times and locations of UFO appearances. Let's talk about each of these. First, who are the contactees? The UFO contactees were a small group of people who became active in the 1950s. Basically, they were people who claimed that they were in regular contact with aliens. So that's why they're called contactees, because of the regular contact that they claimed. They were popular in the 1950s and 60s, but they largely faded from the scene after that. We haven't discussed the contactees much on the show to this point, but we will be discussing them in the future. For example, the most famous contactee was a man named George Adamski, and we'll definitely be talking about him in future episodes, as well as other contactees. The contactees commonly claimed that they had received messages that the aliens wanted Earthlings to know about, like, we need to change our ways and take better care of Earth's environment and abandon the use of nuclear weapons lest we blow ourselves up. In fact, they said that our use of nuclear weapons might even hurt people on other planets or in other dimensions unintentionally. The contactees held that aliens were basically peaceful, Uh, morally and spiritually advanced people who are here to help us. The contactees often referred to the aliens as our space brothers, and they often reported them to look like tall, blonde-haired humans. So they are sometimes called the Nordics because they look Nordic, like people from Scandinavia. Why do Ross and Samples think that their experiences point to demons? Because the contactees said that the aliens made a lot of problematic religious claims. They said that the aliens often claim to be Christians and to worship Jesus. That's not the problem. But they also said that Jesus was one of them, not one of us. That he flew around in a UFO, that Yahweh was an alien, and that Elohim was either an alien or a group of aliens. Sometimes contactees started their own religious groups, which are sometimes called saucer cults. I don't use the term cult because it comes across as just an insult word, so I use the more neutral term, which other people use too, UFO religions. My late wife, Renee, happened to grow up in a UFO religion. Her mother had joined it when Renee was a child. But in adulthood, Renee abandoned the UFO religion and came back to the Catholic faith. In any event, the contactees said that the aliens made a lot of religiously problematic claims, So you could look at them as trying to lead people away from a correct understanding of God and Christ. And that's a behavior that's characteristic of demons. So Ross and Samples see the experiences of contactees as pointing to demonic activity. What do you make of that claim? Well, if the aliens really told the contactees these things, then I agree that that would be evidence. They would be making false claims and leading people away from a true understanding of God and Christ. And that is something demons are known to do, which is why the New Testament tells us to test the spirits that we encounter. However, this would not prove that UFOs in general are demons. The most it would prove is that the aliens that were in communication with the contactees might be demons. There also could be genuine extraterrestrials visiting Earth, though, and maybe the demons decided to impersonate them, since humans are curious about extraterrestrials. So the demons saw a good way to spread their own message, their own ideas, based on something humans were curious about, and they decided to impersonate extraterrestrials to advance their agenda. You said if the aliens really told the contactees these things. Is there reason to doubt that? Oh, yeah. As we'll see in future episodes, the contactees of the 1950s and the 1960s had serious credibility problems. For example, they often describe being taken on journeys to where the aliens came from, to our sister planet the moon, 
to Mars, to Venus, and so forth. And they described things in these locations that simply do not exist. For example, the climates of Mars and Venus that they described are completely wrong. The contactees sometimes hoaxed UFO photos, and there are basically just a bunch of signs that the contactees were making everything up. They were either fantasists who couldn't tell the difference between reality and fantasy, or they were mentally ill, or they were deliberately lying to get fame or money or a to advance an agenda. As a result, the contactees are not taken seriously in the UFO movement today. Serious ufologists do not take the reports of contactees like Adamski and others seriously. But Ross and Samples do. They just accept that these accounts are accurate, which demonstrates a lack of critical thinking and discernment on their part. So I'd agree that if the contactees were really talking to aliens and the aliens said these things, then the, these aliens could be demons, or at least under the influence of demons. I mean, they could be genuine extraterrestrials who were just religiously confused. But that wouldn't prove anything about whether other aliens might be visiting. But as it happens, I don't think that the contactees were really in communication with aliens, at least not the majority of them. I think that, in general, the contactees were simply making up stories for whatever reason, and Ross and Samples have uncritically swallowed their stories as if they were real. What about the experiences of UFO abductees that Ross and Samples think point to demons? The abduction experience is very different than the contactee experience. In it, aliens basically kidnap you. Uh, they may do medical and reproductive experiments on you, and it can be frightening. Uh, it's not the warm, rosy experience with the Space Brothers that the contactees reported. It's very frequently reported that the aliens in these situations then try to block your memories of the experience, but they may emerge again through dreams or hypnosis. We talked about the prototypical abduction experience back in episode 61 and again in episode 62 on the Betty and Barney Hill case. Betty and Barney Hill were a couple from New Hampshire that claimed to have been abducted, and their case was the first major one in America and kind of kicked off the era of abduction reports. The Hills experience happened in the 1960s, but by the 1980s and 1990s, there were numerous people claiming to have been abducted. Why do Ross and Samples think that the abductees' experiences point to demons? This is less straightforward than the case of what the contactees claim. However, they do seem to make several arguments. First, though I'm not sure they say it this directly, abductions are frightening and traumatic experiences, and demons are frightening and can be traumatic, can cause trauma. Uh, second, there is sometimes a religious component as part of the abduction experience. And third, they believe that the abductees have opened themselves up to encounters with aliens by involvement with the occult. Let's look at these claims. What do you make of the claim that abductees are encountering demons because their experiences are frightening or traumatic? I'm not impressed with this at all. Lots of things in the world are frightening and traumatic, but that doesn't mean they're demons. To use an example I frequently use, encounters with bears, as in bear attacks, can be frightening and traumatic, but that doesn't mean bears are demons. Similarly, encounters with human serial killers are frightening and traumatic, but that doesn't mean the serial killers are demons. So maybe aliens are just fallen beings like us who sometimes do frightening and traumatic things possibly because their psychology is different from ours and they don't realize how frightening and traumatic they are being to us. Also, I'd note one other thing about how fear is not a good indicator that something is a demon. Periodically in the Bible, when a good angel shows up, the first thing it says is, do not be afraid, which tells us that good angels are frequently frightening when they show up. But Precisely because they are good angels, they aren't demons. But remember also that abduction cases are basically kidnappings. If a bunch of human beings kidnapped you against your will, it would be frightening and traumatic. And so if a bunch of aliens kidnap you against your will, it will also be frightening and traumatic. 
but you couldn't conclude that humans who kidnapped you were really demons, and you similarly can't conclude that aliens who kidnapped you are really demons. You just can't equate fear and trauma with demons. It's just that being kidnapped is frightening and traumatic. What about the claim that there's sometimes a religious component to the abduction experience? Well, the situation is very different than what was reported by contactees. The contactees had all kinds of religion-related messages from the Space Brothers. In abduction cases, there normally isn't any discussion of religion. However, you do sometimes hear about unusual cases where religion is involved. Ken Samples cites a folklorist named Thomas E. Bullard on this point. Now, Samples describes Bullard as, quote, perhaps the world's leading authority on abduction, close quote. But that's nuts. I'm sure Bullard is a competent scholar, but he's only written a couple of books on UFO-related phenomena, and only one of them is on abductions. Bullard is far from the most prominent name in abduction research. Individuals like John Mack, Bud Hopkins, and David Jacobs are all much better known. So this appears to be another case of Samples and Ross being uninformed and selective and sloppy in how they describe things. But Bullard does note that there is sometimes a religious component to abduction cases. Samples quotes an article Bullard wrote for the UFO Encyclopedia in which he states, On rare occasion, an abduction closes with a spiritual experience of some sort. The abductee may hear the voice of God, witness a visionary scene, or participate in a ritual. So you'll note what Bullard says here. This is something that happens, quote, on rare occasion, close quote. It is a rare phenomenon, not something that is typical of reported UFO alien behavior. So once again, we're dealing with outlier reports that may not be accurate. What would you make of it if an adjective did report a religious experience? Well, I wouldn't automatically leap to the conclusion that it was demons. Uh, assuming the report checked out and appeared to be accurate, I can think of several explanations. First, maybe the aliens are religious. It's like that scene from Plan 9 from Outer Space, where two aliens are confronting a group of humans, the main alien is rather irate about how warlike humans can be, and he says, You see? You see? You're stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! That's all I'm taking from you. Get back here, you fool! Let him finish. because of men like you that all must be destroyed. Headstrong, violent, no use of the mind God gave you. You talk of God? You also think it impossible that we too might think of God? So yeah, why wouldn't the aliens think of God? Uh, the Catholic Church holds that it's possible to deduce the existence of God by natural reason, so if aliens have similar reason, they may have deduced the existence of God too. Further, if aliens exist, they were also created by God, so they're also his children, and he may have revealed himself to them just like he did to our species. One way or another, they also might worship God, and Maybe they talked to an abductee about God or had a ceremony of some kind and encouraged the abductee to participate in it. Even if they're in the act of kidnapping a person? Well, if their psychology is different, they may not realize how damaging kidnapping is to humans. But even if they do so, even if they do realize it, I can think of parallels in human history. I mean, for example, when Europeans, like the Spanish and the Portuguese, were exploring the New World, they sometimes captured Native Americans, for example, because the Native American had local knowledge that they needed. And then, in, while the Native American was in captivity, they, or the missionary priests with them, might talk to the Native about God, and they could encourage the Native to participate in Christian ceremonies like prayer or getting baptized. So if we've done things like that in our own history, I can imagine aliens doing them too. You said you could think of several explanations besides the demon hypothesis. What's another? 
Another is maybe the abductee just misunderstood something. Bullard mentions three examples of the kind of spiritual experience he's talking about. Hearing the voice of God, seeing a vision, and participating in a ritual. Well, humans have lots of rituals, and many of them are not religious, like the ritual that happens when you go to your doctor's office, or the ritual that happens when a cop pulls you over on the side of the road, or the ritual that happens when you're checking out of a supermarket. Each of these involves a common pattern of behaviors that typically occur each time, and so they can be understood as rituals, but none of them are religious. So maybe the human abductee was involved in something that looked like a ritual to them, but they misunderstood it as religious when it wasn't. Also, aliens are reported to be telepathic, so maybe the aliens were speaking to the person telepathically or showing the abductee images telepathically, and the human misunderstood this as the voice of God or as a religious vision. So I think misunderstanding the experience would be another possibility. What if the aliens told the person things that were religiously false, like the universe didn't have a beginning, so God didn't create it? Misleading people religiously is the kind of thing demons do. Would that indicate the person had been abducted by demons? Well, it would mean that the claims the aliens were making were wrong, but it wouldn't mean that they were necessarily demons. Uh, Back in the AD 400s, St. Patrick was kidnapped from the west of Great Britain by pirates from Ireland. And the Irish had not yet been evangelized, so they were not yet Christian. And these pirates would have been pagans and had a religion with mistaken elements in it. So they could have talked to St. Patrick and told him religious things that they were mistaken about. But that wouldn't make the Irish pirates demons. If this kind of thing can happen in cases of human kidnappings, the same thing could happen in the case of alien kidnappings. Aliens might just have a religion with mistaken elements in it. And they might relate some of those mistaken elements to a human that they've kidnapped, but that wouldn't make them demons. I need to see evidence that they were demons to draw that conclusion, just like I need to see evidence that the bunch of pagan Irish pirates who kidnapped St. Patrick were actually demons. What kind of evidence would convince you that what looked like an alien was actually a demon? Well, demons are fundamentally non-physical entities. Uh, they don't have, they don't natively have bodies, though they can assume them temporarily. So, if I got evidence that what appeared to be a physical alien was actually a non-physical entity, just temporarily using a body, and if that being was making false religious claims, then that would put it on my radar that it might be a demon. What would clinch it for me is if that entity also displayed aversion to the holy, like demons are reported to display in exorcism cases. So if the ostensible alien couldn't bear to look at a picture of Jesus or Mary, that would indicate the kind of aversion to the holy that is classically indicative of the presence of a demon. Aren't there abduction cases where the person who's been kidnapped rebukes the aliens in Jesus's name and that forces them to flee? Wouldn't that show that they were demons? I've heard rumors of such cases, but I haven't been able to find a documented report of such things happening. I've also heard counter rumors that say exactly the opposite, that if you rebuke the aliens in Jesus' name, they'll just say, we don't care about your religion, which is what a human who was in the process of kidnapping you also would be likely to say if you rebuked him in Jesus' name. You know, if, uh, if, Bob the kidnapper has broken into your bedroom and is hauling you off, and you say, Bob, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, Bob's not going to particularly care. When I read uh, Ross and Samples' book, I was very curious to see if they'd bring up such stories and if they'd document them so I could follow up on them. If they had found such stories in their research, I would expect them to bring them up because they would play right into their narrative. It would it really would be good evidence that at least some aliens are demons if you can tell them to get out in Jesus' name, and that really does cause them to go away. But to my surprise, Ross and Samples didn't mention this issue at all. I can only conclude from that that they didn't run across such accounts or accounts that they considered credible of that happening, because if they did, they surely would have mentioned it. Thus, to the present state of my knowledge, I conclude that such stories are simply rumors, 
they likely arose in the Christian community when someone who believes aliens are demons got the idea of rebuking them in Jesus' name and shared the idea with others, and then others misinterpreted this as something that has actually been done and that actually works. But really, it was just an idea someone had. That being said, if you get abducted, you can certainly try telling the aliens to leave you alone in Jesus' name, and it might even work. Is there anything else you'd like to say about Ross and Sample's discussion of alien abductions? Ross and Samples also think that abductees get abducted by demons pretending to be aliens because they have invited the demons into their lives through occult means. But we'll discuss that in the next section on the New Age movement. Aside from that, I would make two points. First, even if you had good evidence that demons were masquerading as aliens in some cases, that wouldn't let you draw the conclusion that all aliens and all UFOs are just demons. Just like we said in the section on contactees, you might conclude that these aliens are really demons, but that wouldn't warrant you in saying that they all are. There could also be legitimate extraterrestrial biological entities visiting Earth. Demons learned that humans are interested in them, and so they started impersonating them to further their agenda. You can't, real, you can't infer from just because this is a demon to everything in this category is a demon. Just like angels sometimes masquerade as humans, and the Bible points that out, sometimes when you meet a person, it may really be an angel, but that doesn't let you infer that there are no humans and everything that appears to be a human is really an angel. So even if there were good evidence for demons in some alien abduction accounts, that would not show that demons are the general explanation for residual UFOs or alien reports, especially not when we're dealing with outlier accounts like this, since normally there is no religious component in abduction experience reports. What's the second point you wanted to make about Ross and Sample's handling of alien abduction accounts? They're entirely too credulous of them. I'm open to the idea that alien abduction is something that happens, but I don't just take alien abduction accounts at face value and assume they're true. We, we saw why in the two episodes we did on the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. Only a small part of their experience was part of their uninterrupted conscious memory, and that part could be explained naturally. The rest of what they reported came to Betty in dreams or from both of them under hypnosis. But dreams and hypnosis are notoriously re reality distorting. And as we heard in episode 52 on hypnosis, hypnosis is not a magic memory improver. In fact, it promotes confabulation, whereby you relax and engage in a fantasy. Sometimes the fantasy is directed by leading questions from the hypnotist. And then you're given to understand that what you're experiencing are memories rather than fantasy content. I don't trust hypnotically retrieved memories at all. And since the major content that Betty and Barney Hill reported took the forms of dreams and hypnosis, I don't have confidence that anything paranormal happened to them. And the same is true of UFO abduction cases in general. Uh, you'll recall that I said one of the characteristics of these cases is that it's reported that the aliens try to blank your memories. It's also reported that they give you what are sometimes called screen memories that your hypnotist will have to dig through to get to your allegedly real memories. And digging through what you initially remember to get at something else is a recipe for leading questions by the hypnotist. So I think a lot of alien abduction accounts are either inaccurate due to hypnosis or they're outright frauds, which is what I think we heard about in episode 86 on the Devil's Den UFO encounter and abduction. If alien abduction is happening, it's on a much smaller scale than the reports would suggest, and we'd have to use critical thinking to identify the subset of reports that are accurate but I haven't found one yet that I'm fully convinced of. And Ross and Samples don't do anything along these lines. They do not cross-examine abduction cases to see if they're genuine. They just accept hypnotically retrieved testimony as if it's accurate. They accept the abduction reports without questioning them. 
and they rely on outlier cases like the ones that report a religious or spiritual component as if they were typical, which they're not. They're rare. So I see the same kind of problems emerging in Ross and Samples' work here that emerged in the case of the contactees. In both situations, they just take the reports at face value and don't critically examine them to see what's accurate and what's not. Then let's look at the third consideration Ross and Samples brought up, which was the involvement of New Age and similar practices with UFOs. Why do they think that provides evidence that aliens are demons? Well, they claim that people who are involved in New Age practices, which they call a cult, using that term as a scare word, are opening themselves up to demons, and then they have UFO encounters. So the aliens in the UFOs must be demons. What do you make of this argument? Well, let's look at the structure of the argument and see if it would work in another context. Suppose I open myself up to Japanese people by reading books about Japan and emailing Japanese people online and talking with Japanese people on the phone. And then when I'm walking in my neighborhood, I happen to encounter an ice cream truck. Could I really infer from these two facts that even though the driver of the ice cream truck appears to be an American of European descent, that he's really a Japanese person masquerading as a European American? I mean, that would be a fallacious conclusion. The specific fallacy it would commit is known as the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, which is Latin for after this, therefore because of this. My encounter with the American driver of the ice cream truck happened after I opened myself up to Japanese people, so he must be secretly Japanese. Um, without anything further modifying the situation, that's exactly the same logic as you opened yourself up to demons, then you saw a UFO, so UFOs and aliens must be demons. It's just a logical fallacy. You said, without anything further modifying the situation. Can you steel man the argument? Could you modify it so that it would work better? Yes, if two... If it turned out that two further conditions were met, the argument would work better. The first condition is that people who open themselves up to demons have statistically more UFO alien encounters. And the second condition is that there is no other good explanation for this being the case. So if people who have opened themselves up to demons have more UFO alien encounters and there's no other good explanation for this, then that could be at least some kind of evidence for demonic involvement with UFOs. Uh, for purposes of comparison, if people who opened themselves up to contact with Japanese people saw statistically more ice cream trucks, and there was no other good explanation for that, then you could have evidence for some kind of Japanese involvement in the American ice cream truck industry. Do you think these two conditions are fulfilled in the case of demons and UFO encounters? I think both of them are highly problematic. First, we don't have good statistical evidence that people who have opened themselves up to demons see more UFOs or aliens than other people. I'm quite sure that most of the people who see UFOs have not opened themselves up to demons. They're just normal people. In fact, Ross and Samples openly admit that studies testing their demon hypothesis have not been done. They're just relying on their own impressions, and we've already seen that they're very sloppy and unreliable in their anecdotal impressions, because they regularly treat outlier cases as if, as if they were typical cases, and they regularly use exaggeration to support their case rather than stating facts neutrally and accurately. So I don't have confidence in their judgment on matters connected with their hypothesis. Even though we don't have statistics showing that people who have opened themselves to demons have more UFO encounters, do you think it's possible that such people also report more UFO or alien encounters? I think it's possible, but that doesn't mean I think it's probable. However, suppose that it is. Um, suppose it's true that people with New Age-like beliefs and practices, which Ross and Samples think open you to demons, 
Suppose they do report more UFO alien encounters. Here's where we run into a problem with the second condition I mentioned that needs to be fulfilled, that there needs to be no other good explanation for the fact that they report more such encounters. I don't think that would be the case at all. I think there would be a good explanation. What would that alternative explanation be? Well, people who are in the New Age movement have an interest in the paranormal. And into that category go things like psychic abilities, ghosts, Bigfoot, UFOs, Atlantis, and similar things. They also frequently believe in hypnosis as a memory aid. Uh, it's used, for example, in popular reincarnation cases where people are hypnotically regressed and start talking about past lives, like the Bridie Murphy case that we talked about in episode 93 and again in episode 94. And as we heard then, the Bridie Murphy case falls apart when you look at, uh, at evidence concerning it. So hypnosis is not a good tool for retrieving past life memories, which is why modern competent parapsychological researchers don't use it when studying cases of the reincarnation type, as we heard in episode 275 and again in episode 276. Nevertheless, many New Agers believe hypnosis is a good memory retrieval tool, and so they'll be inclined to use it in order to help retrieve memories of an alien abduction as well. Now, let's take the case of a fairly typical, enthusiastic New Ager. Just an ordinary person, you know, not someone who takes a scholarly approach that rigorously tests claims using critical thinking, just an average person who's enthusiastic about paranormal things. Let's say that this person believes in psychic abilities, ghosts, Bigfoot, UFOs, Atlantis, and all that stuff. And suppose that one night they see something strange in the sky. Maybe it's just a satellite going overhead. But it looks like an unusually moving light in the sky. And they wonder whether it might be a UFO. Because they're enthusiastic about their New Age beliefs, they're enthusiastic about the idea of seeing a UFO, and they become convinced it was an alien craft. Then, because they've heard that aliens often blank your memories, they wonder if they've been abducted, and so they decide to go and get hypnotized. And with the idea or expectation of having an alien encounter in mind, well, sure enough, they start reporting memories of having been met and taken by the aliens under hypnosis, even though these things didn't happen and are just a fantasy guided by the hypnotist. Given mechanisms like this, I can see why people who are really enthusiastic about the paranormal might report an abnormal number of UFO and alien encounters for purely natural, normal reasons. So I think there would be a good alternative explanation for why such people might report more UFO and alien encounters. I could say more on this, but my bottom line is I don't think that there that the attempt to steal man or strengthen Ross and Samples' argument would be successful. We don't have the kind of statistical information needed to support the first added condition, and even if we did, there is at least one good alternative explanation for why paranormally interested people might report more UFO and alien encounters for just natural reasons. The argument thus fails to carry evidential force. Is there anything else you'd like to say about how Ross and Samples handle this issue? Yes, they're coming at it from a conservative evangelical Protestant position that tends to regard everything paranormal as demonic. They thus think that anyone who has anything to do with the paranormal is opening themselves to demons. But that's not the Catholic position. In fact, it's not the position of other Protestants, but it's certainly not the Catholic position. As we've discussed in previous episodes, and as we mentioned earlier in this episode, Catholic theologians and doctors of the Church, like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, have been open to the idea that God built weak natural abilities into human nature that today we would call psychic powers. As we said, Augustine and Aquinas both believed in what we would call precognition, which St. Thomas called natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that comes from God. He also believed in a form of what we would call psychokinesis, which was his explanation for the evil eye. 
And the Catholic Church has essentially no problem in principle with practices like dowsing, as we heard especially in episode 247. And the Catholic Church recognizes that sometimes people do encounter spirits of deceased human beings, such as through apparitions of the saints or apparitions of souls in purgatory. And in both of those, you have encounters with ghosts, with souls of the departed. So the Catholic Church does not consider everything paranormal as automatically demonic. But many in the conservative Protestant community do. They'll say that all psychic powers are really demonic tricks, and so are all apparitions of Mary and the saints, and so are any ghosts you might encounter. As a Catholic, I disagree with the it's always demons hypothesis. Not everything paranormal is demonic, and you are not opening yourself up to demons just by contact or study of paranormal things. And you have to take a more careful approach to this subject and use critical discernment in this area. I also don't like the common language of opening yourself up to demons because it's so often misunderstood. But if you'd like to learn more about what I think would do this, what really would, quote, open you to demons, go back and listen to episode 188 on It's Always Demons. You indicated that there was another kind of argument that Ross and Sample's book uses to argue for the demonic hypothesis, and that it had to do with the places and times when UFOs appear. What was that argument? This one was a real head-scratcher for me, uh, but it was brought up in more than one place in the book, so I'll go ahead and mention it. At one point, Ross writes, Rufo's improbable predictability, the similarity of their physical manifestations, attests to their reality on one hand, but that same quality of predictability also suggests their non-physical nature. For example, relative to the number of people out of doors and capable of making observations, 10 times as many sightings occur at 3 a.m. as at either 6 a.m. or at 8 p.m. Many more rufos appear in remote areas than in built-up or populated regions. They seem to prefer lonely roads to fields or villages. The witness list for each rufo is small, rarely more than six people. I had to read that statement more than once because at first I wasn't sure Ross was even making an argument here, but he is. He explicitly says that these predictable qualities, quote, suggest their non-physical nature, close quote. What do you make of this argument? I think it's absolutely nuts. Uh, Ross has named three qualities that he says point to the non-physical nature of UFOs. First, they are proportionally much more likely to be to, to be seen at 3 a.m. than at 6 a.m. or 8 p.m. Second, that they appear in remote areas rather than cities. And third, they typically appear to small numbers of witnesses. What do any of those things have to do with being non-physical? Lots of physical things, like coyotes, are nocturnal and active at 3 a.m., Lots of physical things, like coyotes, avoid places where humans live and prefer remote locations. And lots of physical things, again, like coyotes, are seen only by small numbers of people at a time. Precisely because most humans aren't outdoors in remote areas in the dead of night. So I don't see what any of these characteristics have to do with being non-physical. Nevertheless, Hugh Ross later says, At this point, describing more characteristics of residual UFOs is unnecessary. It can now be determined who is behind the Rufo experiences. Only one kind of being favors the dead of night and lonely roads. When I first read that, I was like, Wow, so coyotes are behind the residual UFO phenomena. Who knew? And... Well, what about all the other nocturnal creatures that live in the boonies and sometimes use human roads? Now, in fairness, Ross goes on to say other things using the same sweeping, only one kind of being language to point at the devil. But here we're focused on this argument. And while I always try to be charitable in evaluating other people's arguments, I think this one is just stupid. 
The characteristics Ross names have nothing to do with being non-physical and are easily explained on the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Suppose that you are an extraterrestrial being trying to do some kind of survey on Earth without unduly violating the Prime Directive and disrupting its culture. Well, the first thing you do, at least most of the time, is try to minimize the number of people who see you. Uh, if you get seen at all, you want to be seen only by lone individuals or small groups most of the time. So how can you accomplish that? Well, one way is by being active when most humans aren't, like at 3 a.m. Many people are active are at 8 p.m., and many humans are waking up and starting to be active at 6 a.m., but few humans are out and about between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., so being active around 3 a.m. would be an ideal time to help you if your goal is to not be seen by many people. Also, going to remote locations rather than cities would help you with that goal. So 3 a.m. in remote locations is precisely the kind of time and place that we would expect ex extraterrestrials who are trying to keep on the down low to be active. I thus conclude that Ross's three characteristics have nothing to do with being non-physical, and they are exactly what we would expect on the extraterrestrial hypothesis, so this is just a bad argument. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? I'd like to reiterate what my claim is, because I often find that some folks lose track of this. They seem to forget how I phrased myself, so I want to really hammer what I am saying and what I'm not saying. I am not saying that demons are never the explanation for UFOs. Demons may be involved in some UFO alien cases, but we need evidence to show that in an individual case. We do not have evidence that demons are involved in all UFO alien cases. So we should not be making categorical statements like aliens are demons or UFOs are just demons, because we don't have evidence for that. In fact, the evidence we have points in the other direction. There is considerable evidence that UFOs and aliens, if they exist, are physical entities. They may do strange high-tech things, but they leave landing marks and impressions on the ground. They sometimes singe vegetation. They return radar echoes. They can be photographed. And they're reported to sometimes leave debris behind and to implant physical objects in people. I don't think that the evidence is good, as good, for the last two claims as the former ones, but the first ones I named are well established and suggest that UFOs are physical. Furthermore, the standard UFO sighting patterns, landing patterns, and even alien abduction patterns, if the latter happen at all, are not what we read about demons doing either in the Bible or in historically, as in exorcism cases. In particular, based on UFO reports, UFOs and aliens do not display the aversion to the holy that demons do. Now, as I said, if you want to claim that some UFO alien reports are due to demons, that's fine with me. Just show me your evidence for particular cases. But please don't arrogantly and categorically just state that all UFOs are aliens, because to do that, you'll need to eliminate all the other hypotheses. You'll need to disprove the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis, the time travel hypothesis, and the physical interdimensional hypothesis. But that hasn't been done. The evidence we have points to UFOs being physical entities, and it does not fit the historical pattern that de of behavior that demons display. Why do you think people propose the demon hypothesis? I'm always hesitant to analyze the reasons for other people's claims. Uh, I prefer to look at the evidence for their claims. But Cameron Bertuzzi of Capturing, Capturing Christianity and I were discussing this, and he made some interesting points. One of the things that he suggested, which I think is right, is that it's due to what's known as the availability bias. In psychology, the availability bias is the tendency to interpret things in terms of information that is easily available, that readily comes to mind. For people with a Christian background, we're used to thinking of God and angels and demons. They're written about in the Bible, and we've had centuries of thinking about them. 
And since God hasn't told us about other planets and what he may have created there, we don't have aliens, you know, in the Bible or centuries of thinking about them. So the thought of aliens is not as available for many people as the thought of God or angels and demons. Consequently, when people encounter claims of unknowns like UFOs and aliens, some will have a tendency to dismiss them outright as not real, and but others will want to interpret them in terms of God, angels, and demons. Uh, some of the in the contactee movement interpreted them in terms of God and angels, but those involved inaccurate religious claims. So others will interpret them in terms of demons because that was what's cognitively available as a cause that could explain them for this person. And if you're operating with the assumption that God would have told us about aliens if he had made them, then the idea of aliens being the actual explanation will be even less cognitively available for you. That assumption that God would have told us will be particularly tempting for people in the Protestant community, which has a belief in sola scriptura, that the Bible tells us everything we need to know about religion. Sola, script, sola Scriptura would not prove that God would have told us about aliens, but it's easy for people in the Protestant community to fall back on this idea when confronting a genuine unknown. And I think this is likely why, or part of why, the it's always demons hypothesis is particularly common among conservative Protestants when it comes to UFOs. But the same view is also found among some Catholics who similarly think that God would have told us about it if he had made aliens elsewhere, even though Catholics don't believe in Sola Scriptura. Jimmy, what's your bottom line? To reiterate, I am not saying that UFOs and aliens are never demons, but if you want to propose that one is, you need evidence, and the best evidence would be aversion to the holy. However, when it comes to the claim that it's always demons when it comes to UFOs and aliens— at least based on Hugh Ross and Ken Samples' book, their arguments fail spectacularly. Their critique of the extraterrestrial hypothesis as an explanation for UFOs that can't be explained naturally fails. Ross's opinions about how many habitable locations there are in the universe and whether it would be possible for aliens to evolve are extreme and well outside mainstream scientific opinion, and even if he turned out to be right on those points, that doesn't tell us anything about what God may have done elsewhere. Even if habitability and evolution are naturally impossible, well, God made them happen here on Earth, and he may have chosen to make them happen elsewhere as well. Similarly, the argument that aliens couldn't get here is bad because we have indications that faster-than-light travel may be possible, and because the aliens definitely could get here using slower-than-light travel. The 15 characteristics that Ross uses to argue that UFOs must be non-physical fail. In some cases, he's relying on outlier cases that may not be accurate and misrepresenting them as typical behavior of UFOs. And even setting that aside, they simply don't show non-physicality. They all represent things that we humans either are doing, could do, will soon be doing, or may be able to do in the future, as illustrated by the examples from human-based tech that I gave. Similarly, the four arguments from Ross and Samples that we covered uh, for the demonic hypothesis specifically don't work. When it comes to the contactees, well, they did spread religiously misinformed ideas, and if they were in touch with non-physical aliens, they might have been demons, but the contactees simply were not credible, and we shouldn't be gullible and believe their claims about what the Space Brothers allegedly told them. When it comes to the abductees, Ross and Samples similarly were totally uncritical in sorting good reports from bad reports. They appeared to gullibly accept every abduction report as if it were true. And to make their case, they relied on outlier reports that are even less likely to be true than normal abduction reports. When it comes to their arguments about New Age occult involvement, they uncritically lump everything paranormal into the category of demons. They do not display a critical sensibility that sorts through these things in a discerning manner. 
They're relying on anecdotal impressions with no statistics to back them up. And there are plausible alternative explanations, even if it turned out their anecdotal impressions were true. Finally, when it comes to Ross's UFOs appear at 3 a.m. on lonely roads to small numbers of people argument, this is just nuts and in no way shows that UFOs are non-physical or demons. The bottom line is that UFOs and aliens might sometimes involve demons, but you need evidence for that in particular cases. When it comes to residual UFO cases in general, we have significant indicators that they are physical and that neither they nor the aliens are reported to display historically known patterns of demonic behavior. I thus conclude that while UFOs and aliens might sometimes be demons, we do not have evidence that they are always demons. And so, it is not always alien demons. And what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have a link to Ross Samples and Clark's book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. Also, Luke Barnes's critique of Hugh Ross's design arguments, information about the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the interdimensional hypothesis, and information about NASA discovering possible signs of alien life on Saturn's moon Enceladus. We'll also have links to Sabina Hassenfelder's video, I Think Faster Than Light Travel Is Possible, Here's Why, and her video, Are Warp Drives Now Science? As well as Matt O'Dowd's video, The New Warp Drive Possibilities, information on DARPA's Mach 20 hypersonic aircraft, information on the M-Drive and electromagnetic levitation, Xeroth's video, Metamorphic Wings, The Future of Flight is Here, information about programmable matter, including a programmable matter video, and information about metamaterial cloaking. All right. So that's it from us this time. We would love to hear your (laughs) theories. That was a comprehensive look. So we want to hear your theories. If there's any left about the idea all aliens are really demons, you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they do on Mysterious World. They're also available for your video and animation needs. Um, Be sure if you haven't yet checked out the video version of the podcast to do so by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my channel. And so I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe and hit the bell to get all the notifications whenever I have a new video up, whether it's a mysterious world video that, you know, comes out at least every Friday, as well as other videos that I put up. Um, Also, while you're there, if you can like the videos that you watch that will tell YouTube's algorithm that you're interested in them and other people might be interested. So it will promote them to other people. So you can help promote the show just by clicking the like button. Also, if you comment on it, that will do the same thing. So like, comment, and subscribe, please. So Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be talking about a phenomenon known as announcing dreams. These are dreams in which a prospective mother or sometimes a prospective father has a dream. And in the dream, it is announced that they will have a child. They're told the child's sex, hair color, and sometimes even its name and other details. And then all of this comes true. Experiences like this are surprisingly common. So we'll be talking about announcing dreams and what may be responsible for them. Very good. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt or mug or more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 281. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com.
Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And by... Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.